Hi, welcome to Chrome University 2019. I wanted to give you a presentation called Life of a Codec. I know this is sort of the Chrome OS track if you look at the, um, the presentations, but this isn't necessarily Chrome OS related. It's Chrome and Chrome OS related, um, but hopefully you'll enjoy it. And the organizers of Chrome University asked us to favor breadth over depth for Chrome University. Um, and that's great for me because I'm a PM, not a SWE, so it fits in nicely. So the usual caveats apply. Um, if there are technical problems in here, I'll direct you to my engineering team and you can you know, ask them how everything works. So Chrome um, media consumption is millions and millions of hours a day um, across a browser in Chrome OS. Um, and I wanted to talk to you about how video codecs, audio codecs are developed, deployed, and deprecated. So what is a codec? Um, the dictionary definition is here, and the important thing to notice is that it has to uh, compress and decompress received data. So normally when we talk about codec, it comes from coder, decoder, and you need both sides. Um, and codecs are used to compress media for storage, transmission, or playback. And in this uh, talk, I'll be talking about mostly video, um, but there are lots of different kinds of codec. So you guys all know one codec at least. Um, you guys all should recognize this if you used a computer in the 90s. So you guys all know about MP3s. And this heralded in you know, codec knowledge for everybody. So this is Winamp and you can see Napster in the background. Um, and the important thing is that media compression, in this case, MP3s, allowed us to share uh, and transmit music files over the internet much, much faster than you would be able to do so if you were trying to transmit raw files off of a CD. Um, there are a lot of different types of codecs. Um, Google uh, runs some projects and then contributes to some other outside projects for all of these, video, image, audio, and geometry. VP9 is a, a WebM project, kind of a Google run uh, codec uh, development. WebP is, is similar. Um, we have Opus for audio, and then we have Draco for uh, geometry compression. These are all examples of open source codecs um, where, that are available to anybody free, free on the web. Um, we mentioned briefly that you need encoders and decoders, and the reason for that is if you want to use a video conference app in uh, Chrome or mirror your screen or something like that, you need to have an encoder to scrape the screen or use your webcam. So that's why you need both. So I'm going to talk about uh, mostly video codecs. And when I talk about video compression, the first thing everyone thinks of is this TV show, Silicon Valley. But it actually is, um, makes a lot of sense, and it actually is, is, is quite important here. Because if you look at the credits in the first season, uh, depending on what team you're on in Chrome, or you might recognize some names. So we've got Jim, Matt, Yahoo, and Jeremy here. And um, Jim, Matt, and Yahoo all are in the Chrome Media team. They came from a 2010 acquisition of a company called Onto, and they've worked on the VP series of codecs, VP6, VP8, VP9. Um, Jeremy was instrumental in that acquisition. He works at YouTube now. And there's a lot of teams at Google outside of Chrome that work on media compression as well, but um, they were chosen to be technical advisors to the show um, for uh, making the video compression parts accurate, or as accurate as possible while still being humorous. So why do we need video compression anyway? Um, so this dog is really sad. He wants to watch cat videos on YouTube. But the problem is that a 1080p uncompressed video at 30 frames per second, he wants to see a, you know, a good quality video, is 1.49 gigabits per second if you streamed it raw. So yeah, you think that JPEGs do a good job of compressing your images. Video is a whole other level. Um, and the average uh, internet speed in Singapore is 150 megabits per second. I think it was number one last year. And so you still can't even watch anything at 30 FPS. It's going to be absurd. So small cats are better. So we want to use this example of H.264, which is an older video codec. And instead of doing it 1.49 gigabits per second, we can actually get it down to 5 megabits per second at very good quality. And this is representative of what, of what YouTube might use as a bit rate for streaming 1080p 30. So how do we make these codecs? Um, there are two organizations I want to talk about that work on codec development. There are many other groups around the world, but two that work on um, video codecs, I should say. So one is MPEG, and you're probably familiar with them because they uh, have the greatest hits here. They have MP3, of course, MPEG 1 Layer 3. They have MPEG 2 Video, which is used for DVDs and ATSC terrestrial broadcast uh, in the United States and I think South Korea. AVC, which is used in Blu-rays, 
and um, H.264, which is used on all kinds of internet streaming. And then HEVC, which is a newer codec, um, used in high-end consumer uh, camcorders, as well as um, Ultra HD Blu-rays um, and some newer technologies. And one of the things I want to point out is that Google does participate in MPEG, but MPEG is not a organization that has royalty-free provisions at its heart. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So the Alliance for Open Media is a consortium of companies that also develops codecs. We have a video codec and a still image codec right now. We might do audio. And it was founded in 2015. And this is a huge number of tech companies that work on web technologies mostly. And we are, have released AV1 uh, last year and AVIF, I think, earlier this year, the still image format. And one advantage of an organization like this, in addition to just having a lot of industry participants behind it, though MPEG does as well, is that uh, royalty-free policies uh, exist in these organizations. So all contributors agree in advance to license their patents at no cost. So this is very different from MPEG. And if you look at the development of open source, which is the bottom, versus kind of the closed source MPEG ISO world at the top, you'll have this diagram of video codec development. And it's a little bit different for the two groups. So the bottom one is WebM, which was kind of a Google run thing, and then it transfers to AOM. So 2003 is when 264 came out, and VP8, which was that onto acquisition that was open sourced by Google, came out in 2010. And they were about roughly on par as far as efficiency. So open source is about seven years behind. In 2013, HEVC came out, and VP9 open source was released, and they were about on par as far as efficiency in the same year. And last year, we released AV1, which is about 30% better, and we're still waiting for the MPEG world to come out with H.266. We don't know what the compression is going to be yet, but they are a few years behind um, our release cycle, at least. And you know, we talked about the royalty-free policies that AOM has, but for MPEG, it's a little bit different. For codecs such as HEVC, it's developed by organizations that don't require specific financial terms ahead of time. So even though patent holders might agree to fair and reasonable licensing fees, what that means, the definition of that, differs for different companies. And so there's uncertainty um, about what the fees might be. So that's why we focus on open source codecs, especially coming from uh, organizations with royalty-free policies. So how do these codecs work anyway? So we have this cat, and we want to compress him. And in H.264, so this is 2003 technology, um, we look at blocks. And this is actually very much like JPEG work starting, I think, the 80s when JPEG development started, where you look at blocks and you try to divide an image up into blocks and figure out what the, the, block si the largest block size you can actually have, up to 16 by 16, such that there's not a lot of variation in that block so that you can code it um, together. And so with 264, you have a 16 by 16 block. is the largest block size, and you can go down to 4 by 4. There's 17 possibilities. So this is kind of a search problem, right? And uh, the question about efficiency in this codec is how far, how long are you willing to search? How hard are you willing to search to make sure you've got the optimal block partitioning? Um, and you can do a really bad job and make a compliant H.264 video, and it'll just have really low efficiency. Or you can try really, really hard and make a H.264 video that's a lot uh, more efficient and more compressed than another one. AV1 released last year has a lot more options for block decomposition. So we have 128 by 128 blocks, and you have all these weird blocks. Some are rectangular, not square. And there's about 10 to the 6 possibilities uh, if you go down all the way down to 4 by 4. So this just means that the search space is much larger. And as you can imagine, uh, it takes more software uh, computation time to be able to do, got, do a good job of encoding this video. However, the efficiency is going to be much greater. So at the same bit rate, you'll have a lot more quality or the same quality video at a much lower bit rate. There's also uh, the next part, part is about uh, intro prediction. So on the same frame, we're still talking about one frame of the video at this point, where you want to be able to say, this block is similar to another block. This is actually um, a blown up version of the whiskers here. And you can see that these two blocks are actually quite similar, even though they're two different parts of the image. And what we can do with uh, blocks like this is we can, uh, in newer codecs, we can say we want to do some rotation or some warping so that we can try to match up these blocks in a, in a more similar manner. But of course, this is a video, so we have multiple frames. So we have interprediction, so temporal prediction. And what we want to do is say from frame to frame, what's changing? Can we just point back to the image before, the frame before, 
and say, let's just use that block and copy it forward. And that's how you save uh, data. So in this um, video, if you're watching on YouTube, I think this talk is being recorded, the slides and the background is gonna be updated far less frequently than um, myself who's talking because I'm moving around, I'm talking, and the stuff in the background, perceptually you don't care as much because it's not the center of attention, but also it's just not changing as much. There's a lot of new tools that have come out in newer codecs. It's not just about block-based coding um, and different transforms. This is one that I actually really like um, that was um, invented for AV1. So this one is called film grain synthesis. So this is a still frame from, do you guys know what movie this is? The Godfather, right, by Coppola. So this is a digital transfer from the Blu-ray that Coppola himself oversaw the tra transfer of. So he actually was involved in saying, I want this original film digitized and put on Blu-ray in 1080p. So what do you notice about this? For, so the first thing you might notice is that the colors are a little bit washed out, right? That's intentional. Coppola wanted to keep the exposure that he did on the film, which was intentional, in this. So if we had saturated these colors, he would not be happy with that. Um, but that's not the film grain part. The film grain part is, it's hard to see on this slide, unfortunately, but there are a little bits of noise in the image that are not due to compression artifacts. They're actually due to film grain that was on the film when he shot it. So these are kind of noisy patterns that appear when you actually use film to shoot something. And Coppola wanted to retain this film or this noisiness in his video. And this makes it really hard for compressors and codecs because you are, have a really hard time compressing random noise, right? Um, all of you guys who studied math should know that. And so um, a very smooth image without noise is much easier to compress. So some codecs denoise the image and then compress it, but it's not, um, it doesn't have a lot of fidelity to the original image or the original video. So I think Netflix proposed this tool and it was developed in AOM. And what we actually do is we characterize the film grain or the noise in the image, denoise the image and compress it and send it along. And then in the container, in the bitstream rather, send parameters for the noise and reconstruct the noise at the end. Okay, so it's very crazy, but it means that for directors and artists, they actually get to display to the user what they intended to show, which is quite interesting. Okay, so we've got this fancy codec. Um, what are we gonna do with it? We wanna deploy it, right? And this is uh, gonna be difficult because it's new technology and we're gonna ship it in Chrome. Um, so how do we get a video to play in Chrome? How do you get a video to play in a browser at all? So do you guys remember plugins from before 2007? Uday does, I know that. Okay, so what, what is this? Flash, we just deprecated this, right? That's great. And what is this one? A little less known. Silverlight, right? So before we, um, a long time ago, you used to actually have a plugin that would decode the video for you. And so Flash um, had a proprietary version of T6.3. It actually licensed onto its technology VP6 for a while uh, before Google, uh, we bought that company in 264. Silverlight was a Microsoft technology, so it used H.264 as well, as well as VC1. And plugins are terrible, um, as we all know. So luckily, circa 2007, HTML5 came out and we had the video tag, um, which meant that as long as a browser had a codec built in, it could decode, video, audio, or whatever you were trying to display, um, you would be able to do that without having a plugin. And it also meant that you would write a player in JavaScript. So Chrome has this project called Chaka Player, which is an open source JavaScript uh, player that can do video playback, media playback, encrypted video, all of that kind of stuff. But the important thing is that you don't have a plugin anymore. Um, okay, so the good news is you don't have a plugin. The bad news is that means we have to put a codec into Chrome. Um, so how do we do that? So this is kind of the life of a codec. You write the spec for the codec, and then the first thing you can do is you can write software. Software is easy, it's field updatable, um, it's fast to write, um, but it's power hungry. You're never gonna be as efficient when you write software as if you could design it into the hardware, but at least you can do it quickly. And it has some performance issues. Depending on the machine you're running on, it's gonna operate differently, so if you're decoding video. So hardware is a lot better, but it has a lot longer lead time, a long, longer development cycles, and you can't update it. If you have a bug in the field, you have to deal with it. Um, and then as these two things happen, you get a lot of usage in different um, use cases. And then finally, over time, you can deprecate it. So now, now we just need to write our software decoder and put it into Chrome, or our software codec and put it into Chrome, 
um, and wait for the hardware to show up. So that should be pretty easy. So what's the first thing you care about when you're writing something in Chrome? Okay, one of the things we talk about is, is speed. And um, speed is, um, oh sorry, I wanna go back one slide to mention this. Most of the time when we talk about new features, especially new codecs, we start out by um, doing them on desktop. So if you're familiar with the nomenclature, for Chrome, uh, when we say desktop, we mean desktops and laptops. We mean Linux, Mac OS, um, Windows, Chrome OS. Um, we just mean that it's not gonna be on you know, a mobile device like Android or iOS. And the reason we can do that is the heavy lifting can be done by you know, a, a higher power CPU than if you had to do something on Android or iOS, especially when battery life is a limitation because it's less of a problem on laptops and it's not on desktops. So the first thing we might say we care about is speed. You obviously want to write a decoder that's really fast um, so you can have a really good performance for the user. But there's a lot of challenges with that and it's not just about efficiency. We have to worry about the binary size. So one of the things we have to do every time we add a codec um, or any other feature that you're developing for Chrome, you're gonna have to look at the binary size of the, the uh, update as well as the uh, installer and say, is this worth it? And you're gonna have to fight a lot of people in Chrome, rightfully so, who are pushing back and saying, we can't take this 500 kil kilobyte hit. Um, the next thing you have to care about is security. It's one of the other tenets of Chrome that we talk about all the time. Um, but along with security, uh, means that you have to be able to update this codec over time. So you can't throw this technology into Chrome and expect that you're gonna be able to not touch it for a long time. You might worry about DRM for uh, wide wide encrypted videos, for example, in Chrome. And then last but not least, you care about power because we saw, said that some of these people are working on laptops and users care a lot about the power efficiency of their uh, browser. Um, and we you know, get some uh, press about that as well in Chrome. So it's very important to have a codec that uh, is as efficient as possible, but also as performant as possible. Okay, so our dog is still sad. Why, why, right? So our dog is sad because now we've got a codec in the browser, it's ready to decode video, and there's no video. And the reason is that it's only useful to deploy a new technology in Chrome if someone is gonna use it. And um, we need to go and reach out to some of the streaming video providers and say, hey, will you use this new technology? Will you use this new codec? Luckily for us, up the street, um, we have uh, this company called YouTube, which happens to be a pretty large streaming video provider, which means a few things. One is that they care a lot about um, egress costs and how much the bandwidth costs them. So they're willing to adopt newer technologies to compress videos um, because they'll save a lot of money on bandwidth. The second thing is they care a lot about users all over the world. They're not popular just in one region. And so reducing bandwidth means that you'll get higher watch time by more users around the world. Or you'll get users that have higher definition content or higher fidelity content at the same bit rate, which means they'll increase watch time. So that's great for YouTube. When VP9 was released, um, YouTube was kind of the first and only for a little while streaming video provider that adopted it. Um, there are some questions about if other people were gonna to switch to the MPEG uh, HEVC codec. But over time, we've actually gotten Netflix and Facebook on board who are using VP9 as well as uh, and, uh, other companies. For AV1, we're even more excited because we have all of those companies on that slide who are working on the codec. And even though AV1 launched last year and YouTube started supporting it in September, we already have uh, Hulu and Facebook serving AV1 video as well as other people who are gonna be announcing it this year. Um, so now we've got the other side, we've got the streaming providers. So now we're good, dog should be happy, um, except when he switches laptops, his codec is gonna work differently, right? Because it's, the CPU is different. So what are we gonna do about that? So luckily there are some extensions in Chrome or uh, APIs in Chrome that can help with this. So this is media capabilities introduced in, I think Chrome 63 or 64, that allow you to check not only if a codec is gonna be able to be played well, or played in the browser, but if it's gonna be able to be played well. Is it power efficient, is it smooth? And by taking information like this from uh, the browser, you can actually figure out if you should even use AV1 or VP9 or a different codec on that machine. So the dog will be happy. But then what happens if he's watching a small video of a cat and then he wants to full screen it? We talked about performance in software decoding. He might not be able to watch AV1 uh, at a full screen um, because he can't decode 1080p and AV1. We don't wanna have the video stutter. We don't wanna have it reload. Um, that'll make him sad. So then we use another API called change type. 
And this was introduced in Chrome 70 last year. It's really interesting, actually. Using the regular video tag, it lets you switch the source buffer on the fly. And you can switch containers, and you can switch the uh, video codec. So you can switch the entire stream, and it's kind of transparent to the user because the next frames come in using the different codec, and they show on the screen. So if someone has a, a video playing full screen and then switches it back down to a smaller view, you can switch from VP9, a very performant codec that maybe has hardware decoding, to AV1, which is more efficient but is in software. Um, and the user won't even notice. So we affectionately call this codec splicing for us. So now we've gotten our deployment set. We wait for hardware to show up for all the other devices that can't do software decoding, and we um, roll it out to all the devices. And I should mention that we mostly talked about desktop software decoding, but we do software decoding of codecs on uh, mobile devices as well. There's nothing inherently um, problematic or wrong about using a software decoder on a mobile device. So the last thing I wanted to talk about was codec deprecation. We talked at the beginning about how do you get rid of technology in Chrome that you've put in that is now um, so old that we have a lot newer things that can replace it. So this is a problem, especially with codecs. And the reason is that um, people like to use old stuff if it still works. And it's really hard to get people to switch to new things. So as recent as 2017, this is an encoding.com report, uh, they said that 79% of streaming video was H.264. And that was released in 2003. So these numbers are about the same today, about 79, 80%, I would say. So um, 16 years after H.264 was released, it is still the dominant codec on the web. Why is that? AV1 is uh, much, much more efficient. I mean, it re requires 70% you know, fewer bits to transmit something similar. Um, and to put this in perspective, the number one selling phone in 2003 was this. So the two things I want to point out here. One is this had an amazing you know, 12-bit screen, um, 128 by 128 display. But the other thing I want to point out is that actually the creators of H.264 did an amazing job, right? They invented something in 2003 that was able to work flawlessly until today and still works. So first of all, we should give them credit for doing such a really amazing job with H.264 when this was the technology at the time. But the second thing we should think about is, this is the technology at the time. We've come a long way. We should be able to go further and develop new stuff and get it deployed. But there are some considerations. So one is abandoning users. There's always going to be streaming video providers out there who are using older codecs. You are never going to get down to 0% of people using older codecs. So at some point, you have to say, it's more beneficial for everyone to reduce the binary size by removing this codec. Um, but with 264 especially, it's going to be very, very hard. Um, with uh, RTC, uh, real-time communications, there are different requirements for codecs. So a codec that performs well for encoding and software might be great for a lot of uh, users for RTC who are trying to encode just a low-resolution webcam. Your webcams are, what, 720p? Um, so you don't need a hardware encoder, perhaps. You can just use software. So someone who's running an RTC app might never want to update their codec because things are working OK, um, and it's good enough. And then, of course, there's local playback. For Chrome OS, someone is going to want to drag in that H.264 video into the video player, and they expect it to play. And as long as they have a camera that's capturing an H.264 that they might plug into their Chromebook, this is an issue that we're going to have to deal with. And there's a lot more issues that we have to worry about. So the end point I want to make is about video codecs, but also about Chrome in general, which is whenever you're developing technology, uh, in this case a codec or anything else for Chrome, and you're including it, not only should you be excited in, uh, about the technology you're developing, excited about the number of users you're going to get, but realize that when you get a lot of users, and we want that because we want people to be able to use the stuff that you're building in Chrome, you also have to think about how are we going to sunset this at some point in the future? Because at some point, the software you wrote or the technology you invented is going to get surpassed, and we're going to have to remove it. But you have a lot of users out there who are still going to be counting on you, so it's a challenge. And it's not something we have solved. Um, it's something the Chrome Media team is working on right now, trying to um, make a roadmap for codecs and codec de uh, deprecation. But I just wanted to point that out because it's applicable to things other than codecs.